Hey guys, what's happening? So we're back with another big spill full story, where this time around we're getting into Cosmic Ghost Rider Volume 2. So if you're enjoying these videos, make sure to drop a like, subscribe if you're new to the channel, and don't forget to hit that bell up top to get all notifications so we can squat up in the comments for the first hour. Alright, so first thing, it's been a while since we talked about Cosmic Ghost Rider, and really the last time we had talked about him on the channel, it was around the time when he had just joined the Guardians of the Galaxy, and I got a ton of playlists down in the description below in case you want to get caught up a bit, but for anyone who's just completely new to Cosmic Ghost Rider, here's like your quick rundown of who he is and how he became the Cosmic Ghost Rider, because for starters, he has the same beginnings as Frank Castle from the main Marvel Universe, Earth 616, and in some ways you could say that he is because of time travel and things of that nature or Betty at Thanos messing with time and altering events at one point in the future. But for the sake of this video, we're just going to keep it simple. He's Frank Castle. He was a soldier. His family got killed, which then caused him to become the Punisher. And after doing that for decades, he died alongside of a lot of other heroes during an OP attack from Thanos, which we were briefly shown during Thanos wins. But for this version of Frank, death was only the beginning because after dying, Frank made a deal with Mephisto causing him to become a spirit of vengeance. But with him being on the earth with everybody pretty much dead already, there was no vengeance to serve, and this left him in isolation for about a thousand years. And not only did all this time alone drive him into madness and make him insane, but also for the writers from what we've seen, it was this madness that gave the Punisher a sense of humor. But then after this, all of a sudden, Galactus shows up, and he made Frank Castle, the Ghost Rider, his herald. But after that, Thanos killed Galactus, so Frank then worked for Thanos up until Silver Surfer Black killed him. But just before that timeline was destroyed, Odin snatched Frank Castle out and brought him to the Valhalla of the main Marvel Universe, only to then send him off through time, which is what then starts off Cosmic Ghost Rider Volume 1. But real quick, I also gotta say, and I'm just thinking of this looking back now, but it's kind of funny how, at the time, Odin told Frank that he doesn't deserve to be in Valhalla, and that he's not at rest, and how Odin thought that Frank never would be, like ever, only for Odin to later end up in that same situation. Though mind you, more recently Odin has made his way into Valhalla, but prior to that when he was stuck in the hammer, it kinda felt like him getting a taste of his own medicine, just for a little while. But nonetheless, like I was saying, it was Odin who sent Frank away, from Valhalla and through time, that started the events of Cosmic Ghost Rider Volume 1. And again, I got links down in the description to get you guys caught up, because there's a ton of videos that we covered. But if you guys want me to change some of that stuff over to long format, just let me know down in the comments. So much like I did with this video, I'll convert the others into long form content. Just let me know in the comments which ones you want to see. But with the way that this begins, the tone, to me at least, it feels a lot different than any other time we've talked Cosmic Ghost Rider. And I'm sure that has a lot to do with it being written by Stephanie Phillips rather than Donny Cates. But in other cases, whether it was written by Donny Cates or Rick Giovanetti or Paul Shear, you would find the tone of Cosmic Ghost Rider to be a bit Deadpool-esque. And I would go as far to say that not just him, but the whole story. And I like that this time around, at least as far as the first issue goes, it looks like it's going to be a bit more serious. And I mean, the jokes are still there, but it doesn't seem as pronounced as before. But either way, as soon as we jump in, we find ourselves at a space casino where nearly everyone here has been wiped out. And one of the last guys at this casino who's still alive is begging for his life. And he attempts to bribe the killer, but he doesn't want money. And the poor fella goes on to say, please don't kill me. I got a wife. I got a family. But none of this works, and as we continue, we find that this ghost rider goes on to tell this dude, after he kills him, he's gonna personally pay his wife a visit. But then another guy runs up, and he gets his face blasted off, and it gives the first guy a chance to run away. But the dude doesn't get too far before the ghost rider catches up with him by shooting him again and causing him to fall down. And now it's here with this guy who's just pleading for his life and begging for the ghost rider not to kill him, where he's trying to figure out why this ghost rider is doing this. Because if he just wanted to rob the casino, he would have done that. But no, he's wiping these people out. And with hearing this, this ghost rider's like, you know, to take the money and run, only if vengeance was so simple. And just before he blasts this guy, he tells him that he would say to tell his friends that the cosmic ghost rider was here, but then he's more or less just like, what's the point? And he just takes this guy out. And with us seeing this, right after we jump over to Frank Castle, who's woken up, realizing that all of that was just a dream. Or at least it seems to be just a dream, but of course we'll dive deeper into that as this continues. But it's here we find that for some time now, Frank has been staying at Marlo's bar, which he was brought to by Marlo's daughter, Axel, who is also said to be queen of Sector 9's junk district. 
And now this has me looking at her and seeing Junker Queen from Overwatch. And I mean, I can't help it. I love that game. But from what we're told, the situation here is that Axel brought in Frank because as her father would express, she has a thing for wounded animals. And even though her father, Marlo, doesn't really care too much for Frank, because also Marlo feels like him and his daughter just don't need the help. Since Marlo lost his wife, Axel's mother, but Marlo allows Frank to stick around since Frank turns out to be quite helpful. But at one point, Frank steps away to go fix the pipes around the back, so Marlo tells him to go ahead and unload the shipment while he's at it. So then Frank's like, yes sir, just call me the pipe man. But then he thinks about it after saying it, and then Frank's kind of like, you know what? Or don't, you know, don't call me that. It was a bad idea. But when Frank leaves, it's here with Axel and her father Marlo have a conversation, and she expresses to her father how much Frank has actually helped them, rather than Frank being the wounded dog that she's pulled in to take care of. And when this happens, you have this really touching moment where Marlo tells his daughter that they only need each other, and it's very heartfelt. But then it's here where Cad Bane walks in. And I mean, it's not really him, but he has the vibe. And really, it's more of the we got Cad Bane at home kind of vibe. But hey, I get what he was going for. But with him coming here, Marlo first tells him that, hey, they're closed and he's got to go. But the stranger goes on to let them know that he overheard a bit of their conversation. And he knows that they're talking about Frank, but he introduces himself as Crow, and he goes on to tell them that Frank is a lot more dangerous than what they think. And with hearing this, Marlo tries to walk Crow out of the bar, but that technique just doesn't work well for the old fella. And for Axel, with her seeing her father get folded up by this stranger, she then grabs a bottle and goes upside Crow's head. But it doesn't do much, except get Crow to draw his guns and demand the two to tell him where the cosmic ghost rider is. And with all this commotion stirring up, Frank hears it and he comes out from the back telling Crow that the cosmic ghost rider no longer exists. But as soon as Crow sees Frank, things go crazy because he shoots at Frank, telling him that this is for the Sakaran guard, but Frank doesn't know what this guy's talking about. And amidst him not being able to change here, he's still the Punisher, so he's able to get closer and knock one of the guns out of this guy's hand. But Crow flips this around and he grabs Axel. And with seeing this, Marlo tries to reach in and save his daughter, only to then get shot by Crow, killing him right there in front of his daughter in his own bar. But now when this happens, Frank then wakes up again. But this time he knows that that was a dream because there's no way that he would have actually hesitated to pull the trigger. But also with how this is done, issue one is given to us in two parts, much like how it was in Revenge of the Cosmic Ghost Rider. But unlike that series, the second portion of this first issue is a lot more coherent with the first story because it's here where we find Frank sleeping, only for him then to have a zombie hand reach across his chest, only to then find out that it's his dead wife, Maria. But this time it doesn't stop there because it goes through a sequence of people who either Frank's lost or those who he feels like he may have failed at some point. First starting with his wife and next his friends who he lost in service. But instead of trying to talk to these zombified versions of his loved ones, he just transforms and clears the room. But only to then get snatched outside by the huge hand of Galactus, who's still missing his head from Thanos wins, as well as Thanos missing his head, compliments of Gamora. But immediately Frank says, Galen, you look a bit different, must be a new haircut, just cracking jokes on the big guy. But initially Galactus says nothing aside from you're guilty. And it's here where Frank starts to realize what exactly is going on as Galactus tells him that he's being judged for his crimes, such as making a deal with Mephisto, for fighting beside the Mad Titan, for time traveling and destroying time, the list goes on. But for Frank, he makes it quite clear that he wouldn't mind if he was actually being tried and held accountable for the things that he had done. But for one, this isn't Galactus. So he frees himself while saying that he'd feel a lot more comfortable if he knew who he was really talking to. But then next he drops down and as soon as he does, he's then confronted by his children with them asking, daddy, why did you let us die? But again, for Frank, with him now knowing that none of this is real, he just painfully pushes through. And as this continues, he's confronted by headless Thanos as well as a number of other zombies and creatures. But with fighting them off, he eventually does a huge hellfire blast, which this time clears the room all except for one person. And as it turns out, this guy, he isn't some grand villain, but instead he just happens to be a guy who lost everything, his family, as well as his whole planet, to where eventually he used magic to try to get back at the cosmic ghost rider. And with seeing this, Frank destroys the gem that this guy was using to pull this off, and he tells the guy that he's sorry, but this won't bring them back. Magic comes at a cost, and eventually you'll lose yourself. And after that, Frank just leaves him there. Alright, so with how this begins, we find ourselves on an unnamed planet at the far end of the galaxy. And initially we're shown a bunch of people just going about their way in this marketplace until a golden falcon just comes swooping through to then fly on top of the arm of Monarch Starstalker. 
and really with how it's done, it feels like a very cinematic entrance for a guy who either some people don't remember or most people don't even know about. But because I know that you guys are just dying to know who he is, I'm going to take a few just to do a really quick run through on his backstory. Because Monarch Starstalker originally appeared in Marvel Premiere issue 32 back in 1976. And originally he came from reality 7642, where in that universe, humanity had colonized a number of planets. And for Starstalker, while he was piloting his rig, which at the time was connected to his nervous system, he was caught up in the crossfire during the Independence War and the damage to his rig wrecked his nervous system and erased his memory. But soon after he was picked up by a neutral ship with robotic technos who built him an android falcon as a telepathically linked replacement for his nervous system. And seven years later, he became a bounty hunter. And as we find him here on this planet, at the end of the galaxy, it's here where we find that he's tracked down his bounty. And it's a bit of a weird situation here, because with him finding his bounty, and of course with the aid of his faithful nervous system Ulysses, it's here where we discover that his bounty is actually Ambassador Karan of the Shi'ar. And initially for Starstalker, it comes to him as a surprise, but it isn't long before he tells him that it doesn't matter if he's an ambassador or not, because the client wants him dead. But before Starstalker can squeeze, Karan terminates the bounty, and it quickly makes it clear that he set the bounty on himself, just to get Starstalker to come out here and meet with him. Which for Starstalker, initially he looks at this as a waste of his time. And even when he's told by the ambassador that he wants him to capture the cosmic ghost rider, he laughs at the idea of the ambassador doing this and going through all this trouble to get someone to kill the cosmic ghost rider. Because Starstalker knows how tall of an order that is. But the ambassador corrects him and he tells him not kill but capture. And even still Starstalker, he's just like, look man, get your Imperial Guard to take care of it. Cause either way, killed or captured, he's not trying to die over the Shi'ar Empire's disputes. But with saying this, as soon as Starstalker walks away, he's met by a group of B2 super battle droids. And I mean, seriously, they're not, but I'm sure you guys can kind of see the resemblance. But nonetheless, on this planet, they're just responding to the disruption that was caused by Starstalker and his slightly over the top yet still destructive entrance. But even with these droids coming after him, he handles them quickly by deflecting their shots with his shields and sending out his Falcon Ulysses to just slice through the rest of them. But then it's here where the ambassador begins to explain the severity of all this because he tells Starstalker that the cosmic ghost rider isn't who he used to be. In just the last week, the rider attacked the casino on the outskirts of the Theta Quadrant, which was under Shi'ar protection. And because diplomatic relations prevent the Shi'ar from sending their Imperial Guard, he needs Starstalker to do this. And for Starstalker, with him knowing that the ambassador really has no other choice, is here where he then starts asking how much he's going to get paid to do it. And with the ambassador telling him that he'll pay 100,000 credits, which is 20,000 more than he offered the last guy, it's right here where Ulysses the Falcon tells the ambassador that it's going to be 200 bands because they know that the last guy that the ambassador sent out is most likely dead. And with the ambassador having no one else to send out, Starstalker's charging the premium. But after this, we then go back to Marlowe's bar. Just seconds after Cad Bane, I mean Crow, <laughs> shot Marlowe right in front of his daughter Axel. And with Frank having Crow at gunpoint, Crow tells Frank that he can't kill him. And right away, Axel grabs a broken bottle and she jams it in Crow's eye while telling him that she can. So where from there, she doesn't stop with the first stab, but rather she keeps on going and going and going until eventually Frank tells her that that's enough. And perhaps under different circumstances, it would have been okay for her to keep going. But for Frank, he knows better than anyone the pain that she's going through. So he stops her and not only for going overboard, but also because he realizes that they can't stay here because if this guy found his way here so easily, chances are that there are others coming and Frank doesn't want Axel to be here when that happens. And from here, he lets her know that he's got to get her off this planet and find her a safe place to stay and lay low for a while because whoever sent crowd, they're not after her. So when she leaves, they're not going to follow her. And really it's in this moment with Frank saying this with such confidence, as well as Axel remembering the things that Crowl had said with him entering the bar and being after Frank. She then punches Frank in the face, puts a gun to his head and demands that he tells her who he really is. Because as far as she's concerned, he's the reason that her father's dead. And it isn't long before Frank just tells her that he's the cosmic ghost rider, but he doesn't know why someone wants him dead because he hasn't changed in a long time and he's retired. But with Axel, with her hearing cosmic ghost rider retired, she doesn't know what that means and Frank tries to let her know that now isn't the best time for him to explain everything because they need to get out of there before someone else shows up but we quickly come to find out that it's a little too late for that because Starstalker has already found them 
And now that he has the both of these guys pent up in the corner, Axel tells Frank if he's the cosmic ghost rider, then he needs to prove it. But for Frank, he once again tells her that he's retired and that's not something that he does anymore. But for Axel, and understandably so, she tells him that it's more of a case that he won't and not that he can't. Because just moments ago, her father had a gun to his head and Frank didn't do anything. He wouldn't do anything. And she tells him if that's how he wants to continue, that's fine. But she's not going to just sit around like him, knowing that she could do something. And from here where Axel jumps out from cover and goes after Starstalker, it's really like one of those moments where you tell your teammate not to push and they do it anyway. Because for one, none of her shots get to him with Starstalker putting his shields up to where then next his hawk, Ulysses, just swoops in and knocks her down. And now with him having Axel at gunpoint, he more or less tells her, like yeah, the bounty was to bring in the cosmic ghost rider alive, but he doubts that the Shi'ar would even care if he killed her in the process. And just before he could squeeze, we find that Frank is fully transformed and back from his retirement. But even with Frank transforming into the cosmic ghost rider, he notices that something isn't right. Because usually, Frank would be able to make his chains, which were made from the bones of Sidorak, go crazy with the hellfire. But as it stands now, in this moment, he can't do this. Because for some reason, it just ain't happening. And it causes Frank to know in this moment that something's going on because his powers ain't working right. And it's with seeing this where we then jump over to the new Cosmic Ghost Rider, where in his case, I use the term new loosely, because even with his story and his identity being a bit of a mystery at the moment, we're given information here and there that makes it seem as if we're in for a huge plot twist. But at this point with Cosmic Ghost Rider number two, continuing his killing spree, which again is what has these bounty hunters coming after Frank, the original Cosmic Ghost Rider, with most of the galaxy only being aware that there's one. But it's here where the second Cosmic Ghost Rider tells this Omnian priest to have a seat with him, join him for a drink, and he even promises the guy no guns. But as they sit and have their conversation, the priest lets him know that all of these guys weren't bounty hunters, but the ghost rider doesn't really care, and he goes on to tell the priest when you're wanted dead or alive, you don't really stop to make the distinction. But then the priest tells the rider that he's wanted dead or alive because of the crimes that he's committed, and in response, this ghost rider tells him that for a priest to want him dead, it really goes against his teachings, but the priest lets him know that he believes in justice because one doesn't need religion to know that the slaughter of innocents should be punished. But with saying this, the priest takes another sip and the writer's like, how you judging me? And you sipping on an intergalactic Jack Daniels. But then in the moment's notice, it starts to get a bit tense because the writer goes on to say, you believe in reincarnation, priest. And right there, the priest is like, um, is that a question? But then the writer goes on to ask him, do you believe that your past lives could ever bleed into the present? through visions or dreams or something like that as the writer stands up and grabs another bottle of that Jack. And I mean, it's not really Jack Daniels, but you see why I'm saying what I'm saying. But it's here where the priest asks the writer if he's actually having visions or dreams or something like that. Because dreams have been thought to link us to our innermost self, to our innermost desires and fears. But the writer cuts him off right there. And he asks the priest, do you think it's my desire to show weakness? Do you think I fear anything? And right away, the priest, in a panic, he tells the writer, you promised you wouldn't hurt me. But in response, the writer's like, no, I promised no guns. And with saying this, he pulls one of the spikes out from his shoulder to where in this moment, he then gets ready to stab the priest. But then just before he can, he is then stopped by Valkyrie. And even though we don't really know at this point where this lands, as far as what we'd seen with Valkyrie in the Thor series, even still I imagine that the body count that this second cosmic ghost rider has been racking up has been very noticeable from the eyes of a Valkyrie. And as this wraps up, we know that this confrontation, along with the multiple bounties that have been sent out on Frank Castle, are building up for the two cosmic ghost riders to finally meet, as well as the mystery of the new rider getting revealed. All right, so for this one, we pick up right where we had left off with Valkyrie confronting the second Cosmic Ghost Rider, who like we'd seen, aside from him going on his crazy killing spree and making his rounds across the galaxy, his travels had eventually brought him to this fueling station X987 with him looking for Omnian Priest so that he could ask him some questions pertaining to resurrection. And as we make our way through this, we're gonna learn more about what this second Cosmic Ghost Rider is trying to figure out because there's some questions that he's been trying to figure out himself. But with Valkyrie coming here, she lets him know that finding him was pretty easy 
because all she had to do was follow the trail of death that he had left behind that had stretched across nearly every sector of the galaxy. And the crazy thing is, with him hearing that, he's a bit disappointed because he was hoping that he had already reached every sector. So in response, he lets Valkyrie know that he's gonna make an adjustment and he's gonna hit everyone. But in the middle of this fight between the second cosmic Ghost Rider and Valkyrie, out of nowhere, his powers just short out. And it's here where Valkyrie gives him a bit of a speech where we find out that this is also Frank Castle, because it's here where she references what we'd seen in Cosmic Ghost Rider Volume 1, which began with Frank, who woke up in Valhalla after being killed by the Fallen One during Thanos' wins at the conclusion of the 2016 Thanos series. But in this moment, Valkyrie really only says, that Frank wasn't worthy of his acceptance into Valhalla, with her looking at this Frank and the things that he's done. But the interesting thing about this is that for us, for the reader, is that we've been following Frank from Thanos Wins to Cosmic Ghost Rider Volume 1 and beyond, and the story of the original Cosmic Ghost Riders continued. But for that alternate future, which was eventually erased by Thanos, with him going back in time and not becoming that future version of himself, it now begs the question if the events from that series somehow created a second cosmic ghost rider who also made it from that timeline to this one, much like the younger Thanos and the original cosmic ghost rider, which is one of those things when you think about it, it wouldn't be too far of a stretch since Odin brought the original cosmic ghost rider back and recently in the Thor series, a lot of Odin's deeds have just gone left. So it's something to think about. But as it stands at this point, we don't know anything else about the cosmic ghost rider. All we know know is that he's another Frank Castle. And just to be clear, there's no confirmation that any of this ties to Thanos wins, but I just wanted to point out some of the similarities and coincidences so it's something to think about as we make our way through. But then it's here where we jump over to the other Frank, the original Cosmic Ghost Rider who at this same point in time is still dealing with Starstalker, who was hired by the Shi'ar Empire to bring in Frank Castle alive. But it's caused a bit of confusion since not too many people know that there are two Cosmic Ghost Riders in two different places. But at this point, with Frank Castle, Cosmic Ghost Rider number one, his powers also went out on him, giving Starstalker the upper hand. And it's here where he tells Frank, I am Monarch Starstalker, the bounty hunter who brought down the Cosmic Ghost Rider. But in response, Frank just laughs at the name because it sounds like something a kid would name his pet hamster, just because it sounds cool. And I mean, I can see that, because to me, the name Starstalker, it sounds like more of an 80s rock band with one member. But for Starstalker, he really doesn't appreciate the disrespect, and he tells Cosmic Ghost Rider that his name isn't that much more mature. But then while Starstalker is distracted by this silly argument, Axel jumps on his back and she bites this dude's ear, while Frank tries to transform back, and he nearly does for a moment, but he can't effectively go back to full flaming skull, almost as if he's stuck to this near close to in-between state. But as he's trying to power up fully, Starstalker gets free from Axel, and once again he expresses that he doesn't mind killing her. But while he's taking a second to talk about it, he is then shot by Frank, and this gives Frank and Axel a moment for the two of them to get out of there before Starstalker gets back up. But with Frank number one telling Axel, let's go, we then jump over to Cosmic Ghost Rider number two, who's also saying, let's go, but more like, you know, let's fight let's do this. But at this point with Valkyrie, she's trying to figure out what's going on with Frank Castle, because this doesn't seem to be the Frank that she's been told so many things about. Like, sure, he's not perfect, but prior to all of this, she could understand at one point how the Frank that she'd heard about had been a warrior who was given the honor of being accepted into Valhalla. So for Valkyrie at this point, she's trying to figure out why this Frank isn't matching up with the things that she was told. So she asks him, why are you doing this? Because she's trying to understand if there's something going on here that she doesn't see but in response, the writer just tells her that for the first time, he truly feels free. And now with or without his powers, he's finally realizing who he was meant to be. But then suddenly the Omnian priest, who's just been here the whole time, he picks up one of the writer's guns and he tells him, don't make me shoot. But with the writer not taking the priest serious, he charges after the priest only to then catch two shots in the chest. And under normal circumstances, or as normal as they could be for a cosmic ghost rider, these shots wouldn't have phased him. But as it stands now, with his powers going in and out, he now sees that his armor is taking damage, which comes to him as a surprise. And Valkyrie lets him know that he should stop fighting for his own good, because as a Valkyrie, she can see that the death orb over his head is of a significant size. So she tells him to give it up and she lets him know that his fate is closer than he thinks. But this second Frank, he's more or less just like, nah, I'm good. So he then jumps the counter, hits the airlock, and makes his escape. 
with him knowing that doing this will buy him some time because Valkyrie will be too busy saving the priest, which is precisely what happens. But also for Jane, with her saving the priest and using the all weapon to close back the airlock while she pulls him in, she then asks the question that I'm sure everybody's thinking. And I mean, I was thinking it at least, but once they're back inside, she's like, why is that button even there? Why does it even exist? And I mean, it's a very logical question. But from here, where we go back to Frank and Axel, who are quickly making their escape from Starstalker, it's here where we see that Starstalker has regained his consciousness. And with him seeing them leave, he decides to let them go. And it's not anything like him having a change of heart or all of a sudden being like, ooh, well, I don't want that bounty. But instead, it's because he's figured out something about Frank's powers, or really lack thereof, that Frank hasn't figured out about himself just yet. And we discover what that is here when his Falcon Ulysses asks if he wants him to follow them and he tells Ulysses no. And from here, because Starstalker and Ulysses are neurally connected, the two of them kind of explain this together. But the reason why he's letting Frank go is because he notices that the writer is not able to access and sustain his full power, but for a brief moment. And with him saying this, Ulysses does the math and he tells him that it's 3.5 minutes that Frank has. And even right now with Frank getting away on his bike, he's using that power because his bike is connected. So in the next few minutes, Frank's gonna have to stop somewhere. And there's a high probability that he's gonna stop at one of three fueling stations nearby and come to find out this is precisely Frank's situation and when we jump back over to him he's telling Axel that he needs to stop and recharge but it's not like he knows that it's exactly three and a half minutes but he does know that using the armor and using the bike it's spending his power and he can only use it briefly but it's here where we see the two of them make their way to a fueling station just like Starstalker and Ulysses had said and for Frank at this point his plan is the same as before he wants to get Axel out of here and away from him so that she doesn't have to worry about getting mixed up with Starstalker or any other bounty hunters that are really coming after Frank. But when they get to this fueling station, the first thing that comes to Axel's attention is that nobody's here. And with them walking around and peeping in some of the windows, suddenly Frank sees Valkyrie's reflection just behind him, getting ready to bop him in the head with the all weapon. But fortunately, he's able to duck just in time. And as it turns out, this is fueling station X987, the same fueling station where we've just seen Valkyrie fighting the previous Cosmic Ghost Rider. And this is the reason why Valkyrie believes that this Frank is the same guy. But in the middle of her attack, the Omnian priest tells her to stop because this isn't the same writer who tried to kill her. And she's able to confirm this when the priest tells her to open her eyes. So she does, and she sees right away that the priest's death orb above his head is substantially smaller, meaning that his death is no longer imminent. Even though on the flip side, for the Frank that's here, his death orb is huge, just like the second Cosmic Ghost Rider, which is also why Valkyrie believed that they were the same person. But at this point, for everyone here, the idea of there being two Cosmic Ghost Ghost Riders is completely new. So with them trying to figure out how this is even possible, Valkyrie assumes that it's a clone, but the Omnian Priest tells them that he doesn't think that's the case. Because when he spoke to the second Cosmic Ghost Rider, the writer asked him about reincarnation. He wanted to know if his past life could influence the present and if there was a universal connection between all our lives. And when the priest goes on to tell Frank about the other writer having nightmares or visions where he saw a different version of himself in them. And hearing this immediately makes Frank think of the nightmare slash visions that he's been having, which once again has me thinking that this second cosmic ghost writer had came here from a reality that no longer exists. But on top of that, it also has me thinking that it's possible that there's some kind of multiversal connection between the different cosmic ghost writers that has linked them together somehow. But for Frank, with him hearing about this other cosmic ghost rider having these visions and these nightmares, it reminds him of the things that he'd seen in his nightmares too. And Valkyrie goes on to let Frank know that visions aren't always limited to what our eyes can perceive. And she goes on to tell him how she can see things that others can't, like for example, death approaching someone. And she lets him know this is how she knew he wasn't the other cosmic ghost rider, because the priest's orb shrank substantially, meaning that around this Frank, the priest was safe. But also with seeing these orbs, this is how she tracked down the other cosmic ghost rider with the trail of death that he had left behind but then when she goes on to tell frank about how his death orb is still extremely huge meaning that he is still in danger and suddenly out of nowhere he is hit with excruciating pain that brings him to his knees and when this happens for frank we're also shown that the same thing is happening to the second cosmic ghost rider which now just further confirms that the two of these guys are connected 
Alright, so jumping back in, for the most part we continue from where we left off, with both of the Cosmic Ghost Riders passing out. But before we move forward, we first take a step back to a month ago, where we find a group of smugglers who have taken the passenger vessel in an attempt to make their escape from authorities. And in an act of desperation, these guys steer themselves towards a black hole, with one of them being like, I got this, as if his plan is to just fly close enough until the authorities back off. But then suddenly they hear something land on the vessel, which is quickly followed by it blasting its way in, and come to find out, it's the one and only Cosmic Ghost Rider. Well, at least at the time, because again, this is taking us back one month ago. But as we're shown, it's here where Frank jumps in to stop these smugglers, which for him, as the Cosmic Ghost Rider, just going up against a few smugglers, this is light work, because these guys literally have no chance of fighting him off. So at this point, you can imagine for Frank, he figured he'd just jump aboard, knock this out, and just go on about his way. But when one of these guys opened fire on him, all of the blast obviously just bounced off of Frank as he walks up to him and he knocks the smuggler out. But with Frank knocking this guy out, the dude goes flying right into the throttle, sending the whole ship racing straight towards the black hole, which right away has Frank like, whose dumb idea was this? Because I mean, he knows he knocked the dude over, he hit the throttle, but the passenger vessel was only going faster towards where it was already going. And at this point, with them already reaching beyond the event horizon, there's no turning back. From here, they're then pulled in by the singularity, to where from here things get very weird and painful because everything starts glowing white and everyone aboard, including the ship, take on a negative and inverted appearance. But before we go on to see what exactly happens next, Frank hears voices trying to wake him up, and just like that, we're taken back to the present day at the fueling station X987, right where we'd seen Frank in excruciating pain just before he passed out. And when he wakes up, he tells Valkyrie that he remembers. So he explains to her the whole situation that happened a month ago, where he had went to stop a group of smugglers, to where then he was inverted in some kind of magnetic field, and how he believes that it was that event that had taken place a month ago to be the cause of how there are now two cosmic ghost riders. And as it turns out, Valkyrie and the others brought the second Cosmic Ghost Rider here, because when Frank passed out, Valkyrie figured that the other one was likely having the same experience. So they ended up looking for him and he wasn't too far away. But even with seeing this, it doesn't fully explain what exactly happened. And for Frank, the most that he's able to put together is that he fell into this brightly colored hole in space. And the next thing he knew is that he came out on the other side with what he assumes to be perhaps his clone. But then Axel tells him that it's possible that this could be more than a clone and instead a, a piece of him, almost like an element of his identity. And she goes on to say that she's pulling the idea from her favorite book as a kid, which was about this doctor who had learned how to remove pieces from himself. He could remove his fear, his anger, even love. But eventually all of those pieces turned on the doctor because each of them were incomplete without him. And really at this point, they all figure that this is the explanation that makes the most sense because it also backs up the idea of this second cosmic ghost rider being the purely violent side of Frank that he would otherwise only resort to when necessary. So just imagine that portion of him out on the loose with no discretion. And Axel even puts the idea out there that it's possible that with Frank missing this part of himself, it would explain why he's had moments where he's hesitated to squeeze the trigger, like back when the first bounty hunter came looking for him at Marlowe's bar. But while Valkyrie and Axel are trying to sort this whole thing out with Frank, suddenly a chain comes flying from across the room, wrapping around Frank's neck, which not only is a clear sign that Cosmic Ghost Rider number two is awake now, but also with him jumping up and screaming, imposter. It seems like he may have seen the same vision, with number two truly believing that he is the original Cosmic Ghost Rider. But that's one of those things where it's very clear which one of these guys is only functioning on a fraction of who Frank Castle is. And I mean, really, had this been a story that was going longer than five issues, I would have perhaps liked a version of this where the question of who is the real Frank over the course of time being a mystery, with us not being sure which version was truly the original, giving us a few more layers to the other Cosmic Ghost Rider. But I mean, that's something I've just thought about for the past couple issues. But as we continue with this one, we'll come to find heading into the conclusion that there's a pretty big reason why Stephanie Phillips didn't choose to go in that direction. And we'll get to that. But at this point with Frank going back and forth with his other, Valkyrie steps in and she tries to reason with the second Cosmic Ghost Rider by letting him know that he actually needs to hear her out because she can see that his death is imminent. And for a moment he tells her that he's done listening to her. But for Jane, it's like he punched her, threw her through an airlock, shot at her. So she tells him like none of that counts as listening. Like he hasn't really heard her out. But with her going down the list of what he has tried, 
All of a sudden, he's like, you know what I haven't tried? A cosmic blast. But Frank is able to knock him outside before we even find out what would have happened. And I mean, now that I think about it, I kind of wanted to know. But for a moment here, we switch over to Monarch Starstalker, who at this point has narrowed it down to fuel station X987 as the only fueling station left that Frank could be hiding at. And at this point, his partner slash nervous system tells him that there's really no reason for them to be waiting. They know Frank's here, there's nowhere else that he could really run, at least not within the amount of time that it's been since their last encounter. But Starstalker explains to Ulysses that they need to hang back and just wait for a moment, because he had picked up two different identical signatures coming from this fueling station. And right when he says that, both of these Franks just come flying out of the window. So for the time being, the plan is to wait and step in when he sees the right opportunity. Because if you think about it, if Starstalker plays his cards right, turning in two different cosmic ghost riders to two separate bounties could be a nice little come up because the Shi'ar aren't the only people who want him gone. But between the two of the cosmic ghost riders, the original Frank realizes that he's done as much as he can do while trying to reserve his power. So at this point, he has no other choice but to go cosmic as well. Well, which from here then takes the two of them into this all out brawl with rider number two also admitting that he's a bit self-aware with him knowing that he's the one with the quote unquote attitude problem but while they're out here throwing down each one trying to stop the other neither one of these riders gets like the significant upper hand because as hard as one can punch the other one can take and the two of them just go back and forth in a fight that seems like it would last forever or at least until the two of them short out again but then suddenly in the middle of this zero gravity smackdown the both of these guys start to experience that familiar strange glow and right away Frank is just kind of like well so we not gonna acknowledge this very random phenomenon that's happening with this ominous aurora that's surrounding us right now which is then followed by this huge thoom incapacitating the both of them with another mysterious black hole opening up and with this happening keep in mind star stalkers just watching the whole time waiting for his window of opportunity and to take it a step further he was just curious to see what he could learn about there being two cosmic ghost riders but with this huge surge happening between the both of the riders he's not sticking around to find out what that's gonna bring next because hanging around just ain't worth the risk so he ends up grabbing the furthest rider from the anomaly which as it turns out it's the bad one but star stalker just figures grab this one get paid and live because at the end of the day the Shi'ar aren't gonna know about there being two different cosmic ghost riders and as long as he brings them back one he can collect his bounty but in the case of the original Frank, who had already drifted to the point of no return, he gets sucked inside. He once again experiences the whole inversion process, but this time we see him revert back to normal old Frank. And after falling briefly, he then lands inside, only to then turn around and see that there are multiple other cosmic ghost riders who appear to all be different pieces of Frank. Like the one with the white flame in the back, he looks afraid. Blue flame to the right, he's looking very emo. And it really seems that they all have a very specific element that makes them all a very incomplete piece of who Frank is. But also, this goes back to what I mentioned earlier, when I was saying that I would have liked to have had the mystery of a story with us following another cosmic ghost rider without us knowing that he's a separate cosmic ghost rider, which would have been cool, but once again, Stephanie Phillips is going in a whole nother direction. But what I will say, and this could just be me, you guys let me know in the comments, with this story giving us five other cosmic ghost riders, or really six separate, seven total, could be more later, who knows. I just think with this being a five part series and all these other personalities coming out at the end, that this is something that we probably should have got like halfway through issue three, because now there's a whole lot that has to get wrapped up in issue five. And it has me thinking like, mm, it might feel a little dense, but let me know what you guys think in the comments. All right, so in our last talk, we left off with the two different Frank castles going head to head, only to have their fight ended early by the cosmic instability between the two of them, creating a huge bang, which knocked them both out and soon after formed into another black hole, which also created the opportunity for the bounty hunter, Monarch Starstalker, to take advantage of the situation and grab the cosmic ghost rider furthest from the black hole so he can turn him into the Shi'ar and collect his credits. But like we'd seen, Starstalker had ended up taking the trigger-happy cosmic ghost rider out of convenience, of course, 
while leaving the original Frank to drift off into the black hole, where he then landed on this random moon on the other side, where he found the other parts of himself, like his fear, his aggression, his cowardice, that had all been separated from him as a byproduct of him chasing a group of smugglers into a black hole, which was the recent explanation to what kicked all of this off. And for me, I, I can't do this conclusion without mentioning once again that this story just missed the opportunity of using Frank's prior experience to black holes like what we were shown in 2019's Guardians of the Galaxy series when the Black Order crashed the sanctuary during Eero's presentation of the last will and testament of Thanos when the Silver Surfer also got pulled in which kicked off the amazing story Silver Surfer Black. Frank, Beta Ray Bill, Philovel, and Moon Dragon were all able to avoid getting sucked in as a result of the Silver Surfer sacrificing himself and tying the Cosmic Ghost Rider's chain to Stormbreaker so that Beta Ray Bill and the others could all be pulled out. Cause I just think it would have made more sense if this moment had something to do with the Cosmic Ghost Rider's issues with him being on the tail end, barely making his way out of this black hole. Cause now it's like, why didn't this event cause him to go unstable? or at least contribute to the more recent black hole, having these strange effects on him. But either way, now we're just told that because of a black hole, each of these Franks will die unless they are all assembled back together. And now at this point, this is something that the original Frank, he's more or less figured out and pieced together through the course of this series with the help of Valkyrie and Daxel. But if I may for a moment, just share some brief thoughts since we've now reached the conclusion because as it stands, this cosmic identity crisis hasn't fully been explained by way of this story. So I just kind of wanted to put out there something that I was thinking as far as the cosmic ghost rider being baptized in the black hole and it causing his identity to split in all sorts of directions. Like, let's just run with that idea for a moment. We're gonna just roll with it. Because for me, I would like to think that there's a level of logic to this. Because if we'd been given an explanation that leaned into the idea of the existing issues of Frank Castle contributing to this sudden anomaly, because there's a long list to pull from with the cosmic ghost rider being an amalgamation with them starting as the Punisher who became the ghost rider, who later added to that the power cosmic, who may have gone slightly mad over the course of centuries, who perhaps already had a backstory of having a level of instability because of the unique concoction that he is and the centuries that he's been alive, many of which spent alone. All could have been used as a list of factors that contributed to a breaking point, if you will, with Cosmic Ghost Rider's identity splitting and having the black hole, if even using it at all, treated like a catalyst instead of a trope or MacGuffin. Because to me at least, it just seems like black holes in comics for the longest time, they've just become this blank check for plot devices where any writer can just play it fast and loose and tie every questionable aspect of a story to that one thing like it's the answer to it all. And I mean, that's just what I was thinking. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments, cause maybe I'm tripping. But going back to the story, with Frank now seeing all these other portions of himself, he finds it to be a bit difficult to tell these Franks what he's come to know and try to get them all on the same page. Because for starters, when he tells them, they just don't believe him. And quickly, this goes volatile, turning into an all out brawl, which for the most part is a bit of a byproduct or better yet, just a display of how Frank Castle feels about himself at this point after living for so long because with him coming here and telling his other selves that none of them including himself are the true cosmic ghost rider they quickly turn on him and each other forcing frank to use what minimal and short burst of power that he has in this moment to get their attention and get them to listen but he goes on to let them know that none of them are the real cosmic ghost rider because they're all parts of the same person he's not complete without them and vice versa so he goes on to tell them how this came about by way of that black hole that they almost fell into some time ago and how he recently discovered that without each other they are dying and now with hearing the details they just laugh in his face so Frank just proves it to them by telling one of these guys to use their full power because if he's right, then they won't be able to. So one of them gives it a shot only to quickly see his power fizzle out. But this then raises suspicion because now this other cosmic ghost writer thinks that Frank did something to them. So he just lets them know that all he did was tell the truth. And this proves that they're all getting weaker the longer that they stay apart. And now because all of these Franks essentially want the same thing, because at the end of the day, they're all the same person. It's here where they agree with the original Frank that they all need to come back together and fix this. But OG Frank lets them know 
that they need to make their way to the last missing piece of themselves first, who was captured by a bounty hunter with a terribly outdated hairstyle and a metal bird for a nervous system, which now causes them all to make their way from that distant moon on the other side of the black hole back to the area just outside of fueling station X987 to take the last Frank Castle back from the bounty hunter Monarch Starstalker. And OG Frank goes on to tell them, even though their powers might be failing individually, they at least got the guy outnumbered. But back over on Starstalker's ship, he's made aware that his signal is being jammed. And though Ulysses believes that this is the work of the Cosmic Ghost Rider, we quickly find out that that's not the case, as they're then approached by a Shi'ar ship and given the order to unlock the security systems so that Gladiator can come aboard. Because as it turns out, though Monarch Starstalker was hired by the Shi'ar, to bring in the Cosmic Ghost Rider. Suspicions were raised because of Starstalker's absorbent fee, so as a result, they sent out Gladiator, since they already wired Starstalker the credits, and they want to make sure that he makes good on his bounty. So with coming here, Gladiator tells Starstalker that he wants to see the cargo, so he agrees, but with opening the door to the holding cell, they both quickly see that the trigger-happy Cosmic Ghost Rider isn't there. But they soon discover where he actually is when they hear a toilet flush, and the second Cosmic Ghost Rider just comes strolling out, insinuating that he just dropped something very hot and ungodly. And next, after neglecting to wash his hands, the second Cosmic Ghost Rider takes his chances in a two against one. But suddenly, when a thud hits the top of the ship, their attention is directed to outside, where OG Frank and the other Frank Castles have now made their way here so that they can get their merge on. And it isn't too much trouble for them to force their way into Starstalker's ship, since Gladiator recently forced Starstalker to unlock his security, which happened to work in the favor of Frank and the others. And from here, with trouble getting stirred up rather quickly, Valkyrie and Axel then make their way over to the ship, with this being a clear sign that Frank had made his way back. But when they get on the ship, Valkyrie calls for the rider, only to then have all the riders respond to her, which then has her confused, because she's not exactly sure who she needs to be punching right now. But after one look at Starstalker's face, the answer's pretty clear, but with all the riders not really being able to keep up this fight for long, Frank knows that he has to figure this out and get them all back together before any other complications come up. But because he found the other riders by creating a huge pocket of intense energy, he just figures that duplicating that same anomaly with all of them on the ship, it just might force them back together. Or it may just be a painful death for everybody aboard. So to create this anomaly, Frank races Starstalker's ship directly towards the Shi'ar ship's engine and he tells Axel to get everyone out of there safely. But with her having no time to argue with Frank or anyone else for that matter, she grabs Starstalker to get him out of there, even though she really doesn't care to because the last time they met, this dude was about to kill her. But she's not thinking about that. She's just trying to save his life. But with her back turned to him, Starstalker handcuffs Axel to the ship so that she's not able to get away. And he tells her that he did this because last time they met, she bit his ear. Which, I mean, it's true, that's something that did happen, but I gotta say, that has to make Starstalker the most pettiest person in the galaxy for doing Axel dirty like that, for that reason of all things. But with Frank noticing that Axel is still aboard, seconds before crashing into the Shi'ar ship, the next thing we see is the impact and explosion, surging with all sorts of cosmic energy, with Valkyrie watching and apologizing since she didn't get Axel out of there. But then a voice comes out from the stardust, with us then seeing Frank Castle restored, as well as Axel safe and sound right behind him. Which also has me thinking like, you know, in the case of Valkyrie, why would she ever think that somebody's dead if she literally has the ability to see death looming over someone's head? But you know what? I'm not gonna linger on that. But after this, we find out that Gladiator is more or less just put in a word to the Shi'ar with him witnessing firsthand the situation of there being multiple cosmic ghost riders. So going forward, Frank Castle is likely just gonna have to do some cosmic community service or something. So for him, that's pretty much the end of that. And with things being resolved for Frank, he apologizes to Axel once again for what his problems have brought to her in the death of her father. So she's more or less like, you know, saving her from a giant explosion buys him at least some forgiveness. But then she goes on to let him know if he really wants to say he's sorry, then he could give her his bike. So Frank lets her take the bike, but he tells her, you know, just take care of his baby. But as Axel rides off, we then discover that going through a massive explosion with multiple ghost riders and a lot of cosmic energy has caused her to become a cosmic ghost rider as well, which now concludes this story with a the end and a big question mark.
which hints to us seeing more of Axel in the future, which is something that I don't mind, but with just the way that this series was so rushed, it just causes me to have mixed feelings about it altogether. But I am super curious to hear you guys' thoughts down in the comments below, because I really want to know if it's just me, or if you guys might have a different take on it. And so now real quick, I want to give a special shout out to all the patrons. Thank you guys for all your support. And for anyone who's new here who wants more information on how to support the channel, I got a link below where you can go to patreon.com slash dope spill. But that'll do it for this one, guys. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. And we'll do it again on the next one. All right. Later.